Good morning. We are still in the morning. Uh, I'm Rina Dekter. Uh, I will talk today about belief propagation. Uh, you may uh, belief propagation is a Judea first uh, uh, fam famous algorithm, and it's not actually heuristic search. Uh, you may wonder why I am in this session. So the reason is uh, very simple. We had Tom Dean in this session at the beginning of uh, our programs, and when I look at the final program, I thought that maybe, although I'm not talking about uh, heuristic search, uh, the very fact that I was and I'm still working in, in search make me a little bit more suitable for this session. And also, as you will see, there is a connection between what I'm talking and what I was doing when I was engaged in heuristic search primarily. Uh, so this work uh, is, uh, was uh, accomplished for the most part um, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 2000, 2002 and 2003, uh, most of the work, but it involves very simple observations of, on the performance of belief propagation, what's called now loopy belief propagation, iterative belief propagation, uh, which is the extension of uh, uh, the famous algorithm for loopy networks uh, that uh, we now have even a community that is focusing on this work and the desire to really shed some very simple lights on the performance of these algorithms by looking at uh, analogy with uh, constraint propagation. So the work is with my uh, two students, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Robert Matisco and Bajina Biduk, uh, which by now graduated. And I, I thought it was, will be appropriate for the book. It involves simple observation and then an intriguing hypothesis that we had some empirical work to support. Uh, but before we uh, submitted the paper, we decided to do a little bit more experiments. Uh, so I had my postdoc, uh, Emma Rolon, and she carried on far more extent extensive experiments on what I will show you. And it turned out that the hypothesis that we wanted to uh, uh, maintain was not true. So I will uh, talk all about that uh, work uh, uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but I would like to go a little bit uh, farther back, uh, much farther back, uh, maybe when I was born, between 80 and 85, <laughs> uh, uh, when I was a student uh, of Judea at uh, UCLA. Uh, my work was actually in uh, heuristic search. I think I was, I um, mean, during this 80 to 85, this was exactly the period that Yuda was working on Bayesian network while I was working on constraint network. My work started by the desire that we heard about uh, this morning of uh, finding automatically uh, heuristics for heuristic search. I was uh, impressed, like everybody else, by the hypothesis that heuristics are generated by, uh, from simplified models, and I was looking for these uh, uh, models. And I stepped through my search on some papers on constraint processing and the notions of vectric freeness and easy solution for constraint processing, and this uh, uh, caused me to switch to this uh, area and I started to explore constraint propagation and so on. What surprises me when I'm looking back is that I do not recall that I was um, familiar with the work of Judea on Bayesian network. I was completely absorbed by my own research, and I don't recall that we were uh, that I uh, was aware of the connection between our consistency algorithms and belief propagation. Uh, I don't even recall that we discussed this. Uh, so, uh, very few uh, years later, I mean, the connection was, uh, became obvious. And this is what I would like to share with you now. But before I will uh, talk about this, I think it's appropriate to really, through some figures, remember the way Yuda, uh, in his, in another name, uh, 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 used to uh, describe in his book, uh, uh, the belief propagation on Bayesian network, uh, so here uh, he started by looking at chains and described very methodologically in his book how evidence is going from right and left and you can have this message passing, uh, diagnostics and uh, um, causal message, uh, messages. And uh, he made the analogy with, yeah. so uh, now you will have an animation. So the analogy with counting, uh, uh, soldier counting in 
uh, during war or during training. Uh, this is an example that he is giving for uh, this message passing algorithms when you count distributedly uh, all the soldiers, everybody can get the information by two passes of the counting message from right to left. And this is not the figure in his book, but there is one like that in the book. And then he went on and looked at trees and show how uh, you can propagate uh, these causal supports coming from the top uh, and, the evidence, and the diagnostic uh, messages coming from the bottom. And the remarkable thing is the emphasis on the semantics of these messages. So you have the evidence that comes from below x, uh, which is a, a e x minus, and the evidence that comes above x. And uh, each message carries with it uh, a probabilistic semantics, and he developed the formulas accordingly. And this was trees, and then he moved to polytrees, when you uh, have not only one parent, but two, and so on. So this was uh, a, a, the way belief propagation looked at that time. Today we have a more general uh, uh, depictions of the propagations, and people are no longer uh, careful to say what these messages mean, and often they don't mean, they don't have a clear semantic. But subsequently, uh, I mean, the, the intriguing thing was to uh, really even consider this uh, message pass passing propagation on trees uh, for uh, loopy networks. And indeed, it was mentioned uh, in, a, in his book, uh, in an exercise, I think, uh, uh, Yuda suggests the use of belief propagation for loopy network. This was not tried uh, uh, for a while, uh, and it became uh, hot when, uh, I think I have a typo here, in 1998, uh, McLeish and some others uh, observed that for coding networks, the very uh, effective algorithm that was developed at the time is it's actually the belief propagation algorithm applied uh, to the loopy networks that was, modeled, uh, uh, that was modeling the coding uh, problem. Since then, since this realization that this uh, a belief propagation algorithm is a huge success for this particular domain of coding networks, people started to work on it for a variety of other uh, uh, networks. And the intriguing issue was to characterize when does the algorithm uh, converge and uh, how can we guarantee that the results are accurate even if it converges and so on. So uh, there is a lot of research, and in the, in the book there is a survey pa paper by uh, Daphne Kohler that really uh, captures the development that uh, uh, occurred since. Still, uh, it's not clear even today uh, why this iterative belief propagation works well, so well for coding networks. Um, we don't know if we can characterize um, additional good problem classes for uh, belief propagation, and uh, we don't know much about uh, accuracy uh, when the algorithm uh, converges. So what I will do next is I will show you that there are, it is possible to say something very simple with the aid of constraint propagation. So here is a, this, a very simple description of the algorithm uh, or demonstration of our consistency algorithm, which is the primary constraint propagation algorithm, the most basic one. You have here four variables and constraints. A must be less than B, and A must be less than D, and so on. And the domains of these variables are stated there. And you can propagate these constraints locally and realize that certain values of from in the domains of these variables are, no, are not uh, legal. They will not participate in any solution. You can do that uh, in a propagation kind of things until the algorithm until the algorithm uh, terminates and uh, stops. So this is the R consistency algorithm, very well known, very effective. But what is known is that it is sound, it is incom incomplete, and it always converges and it converges in polynomial, polynomial time. So what we wanted to show that there is something uh, we can learn from this algorithm and uh, infer for belief propagation. So now I'm talking about a Bayesian network. You have a Bayesian network with loops on the left uh, with its conditional probability tables. 
But often in this Bayesian network we have determinism, namely certain conditional probabilities are zeros. And we can view, uh, flatten the Bayesian network and only look at uh, the positive and the zero values and view this as a constraint network. So on the right hand side you have the constraint network that ignore the numbers but uh, just uh, captures the zeros, uh, the, the, the CPTs, the conditional probability tables as relations. So now we can ask what would happen uh, when we do belief propagation to the network in terms of the constraint propagation to the flat network. And the analogy is very simple. It's very simple to show that if, if you are doing uh, this belief propagation with just this formula uh, to the network and send messages, it's as if you are doing the operation that you normally do for our consistency as far as the flat network. I will not go into the details, this is just to, to uh, emphasize that uh, there is a complete parallelism. And if, for instance, we will apply belief propagation to this Bayesian network and only look at what happens to the uh, non-zeros, we are actually applying uh, constraint propagation, our consistency. So the bottom line is that the iterative belief propagation is just doing our consistency on the flat network. Uh, and from that we can infer a very simple thing, and uh, we can infer that for zeros, uh, any inference of zero is sound, so at least we know something uh, about belief propagation. And there are also always we have convergence relative to the zeros. And we shouldn't be as excited. When we did this work, I was a little bit taken aback by the excitement of the community as if we solved all the problem by now doing belief propagation on any network. Belief propagation is, can be strong but can be very weak. So at least we know that it's as strong and as weak as our consistency and we do know uh, in the constraint community that this is nice but very limited algorithm. And then, so this is all very simple. And now the, what was interesting is to know is there a continuity? So we know that for zeros we have soundness. It's correct when we infer zero. What if we infer something very close to zero? Can we say that uh, when we infer epsilon beliefs, when epsilon is very small, that it's likely to be accurate? So we wanted to test this empirically. We didn't prove it, and we did. And uh, our experiments on several benchmarks at a time supported this hypothesis. Today we have many more experiments and I will show you just a few of those. So this was the, what we saw on coding networks. On coding networks, uh, this, uh, you have the, the noise of the channel, so we have different level of noises. And when the noise is very small, we observe uh, the, the error uh, function that you should look at is this line here, and this is small uh, error, this is high error, you see that there is absolutely no error in the case of uh, a small noise on some experiments with codings, and as we have higher noises, uh, we, we tend to see a worse performance, but in the area where the probabilities are small, we do see small errors in coding networks. The picture completely changed. These are new experiments that violated our uh, hypothesis. Uh, no, actually no. This is still the good case, uh, another a case of uh, networks where we see uh, that uh, in these areas where we infer small beliefs, these are, these are uh, uh, frequency tables, so these are where the beliefs are small, we see that the error is very small in all these figures. The error is quite small. Uh, so this was another case of supportive information, but then we got to uh, a networks having a lot of determinism, uh, a linkage analysis, and this completely violated our assumptions. We saw that around the zeros we have high, in zero we saw indeed what we saw before, but later on it was the error was uh, far higher, and we were unpleased, but we had to face the truth that this is uh, uh, not correct, and actually, in retrospect, we shouldn't have expected it to be correct. It's very hard, we know that it's very hard to infer epsilon uh, small probabilities. It's unlikely that the belief propagation would solve this problem, but this is only when we saw the bad results. 
Okay, so this was uh, one work, another work that uh, was done separately with Bajena, but again, trying to really understand simple stuff, uh, was looking at the fact of the cutset, or what would happen when, when the inference algorithm step a, at an evidence node or a variable that has a single value. So what we uncover that observed variables break the flow of inference. Now this we know, but we didn't know that belief propagation automatically will, uh, will uh, uh, take care of that. So this is a, it was a pleasing observation because what, uh, or, or proof, because we can now say that if you so happen and you have uh, uh, observed variables that cut all the cycles in the network, then belief propagation will work and will find exact, uh, exact beliefs. Uh, so this was one observation. Another observation was that unobserved area of the networks will work as irrelevant portions and if you don't have evidence, the algorithm is guaranteed to converge in two passes. Not to the exact, but a good one. Empirically, we e e experimented also in this case with epsilon cutset, namely what if you have a variable that is very extreme? Would it act like almost cutting the flow? We proved it for very simple cases and we experimented and, this, and those experiments still stand. We didn't try uh, our uh, more advanced experiments, so we're still hopeful that maybe there is something to this. So I will just in conclusion, I mean, uh, uh, we know something about belief propagation. It is simple, but it's good to have some ground truth. Um, and uh, I hope that we will uh, do some more experiments and see how, uh, whether we violate the rest of the uh, hypotheses that we have. Thank you.